Connecting with my friends, love it. Connecting with some sketchy guy that needs remote access to my computer, really? We hear you. That's why AARP created the Fraud Watch Network. If you don't think this is right for me when you think AARP, then you don't know our... I'm Haley Blakeman, CPEX's Director of Implementation. Thank you for joining us in the Innovation and Implementation and Community Building session. We'll hear from two of my favorite people to work with, Jason King and Tommy Pacello. Jason, <laughs> give him a hand. Jason and Tommy will highlight how they've applied data and planning tools, as well as lessons they've learned from their own projects in Southeast Florida and Memphis, Tennessee. Jason will tell us a little bit about the 750 plan. Southeast Florida will be one of the first regions in the world to experience major impacts of sea level rise and more intense storms. So it's critical for residents to plan together now as a region. 750 is an investment plan that will help ensure that the future investments made to this region are the right ones. And Tommy will share how Memphis has steered revitalization through demonstration projects and used major medical and educational institutions to spark new development. I'll tell you a little bit about our speakers, and then I'll turn it over to them to share some of their work. Jason King serves as Principal and Senior Project Director of, at Dover Culp and Partners. He has directed most multidisciplinary firms, teams, excuse me, around the country, and has served as the Project Director and Prime Author on over 200 plans for cities, towns, neighborhoods, and corridors. From the first plan he worked on in Thailand to the multiple plans he's authored in coastal Louisiana, and finally the 750 plan for Southeast Florida that he directed and continues to advise on, Jason's work has focused on social, economic, and climate change resilience. Jason's work is featured in numerous planning texts, such as sustainable urbanism and form-based codes, and he's been interviewed by the New York Times and National Public Radio. Tommy Pacello is an attorney and city planner. He's the president of the Memphis Medical District. Collaborative, a nonprofit community development organization focusing on the redevelopment of the Memphis Medical District. The Memphis Medical District is a 2.5 square mile area consisting of eight major medical, educational, and research anchor institutions. Prior to working with the Memphis Medical District Collaborative, Tommy served as a member of the Innovation Delivery Team in Memphis, Tennessee. This nonprofit, funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies, is charged with developing strategies to address the city's most pressing urban challenges. I'll turn it over to Jason. So my name is Jason King. Um, when I was asked to come up with uh, innovation, right, in the field of planning, I thought really hard. Our, our profession has been around since cities. And um, I was thinking about the different projects that we do, and I was truly trying to ask myself, what's really new? What's, um, what's a new method or a new approach that's different now, right, than the way we did this before? And um, I was looking at the, the great plan that, that was done by CPEX and by probably all of you. The Louisiana Speaks document and that plan was really the plan that taught us all how to do city planning and how to, really how to do regional planning. Um, there had been some approaches to this before, historical examples that we all studied in planning school, but the Louisiana Speaks plan was really the one that involved the community in an interactive way, asked the community questions at every scale, and build a sort of educational um, program for planning. So, you know, you know this plan, CPEX, the Louisiana Redevelopment Authority, Peter Calthorpe were the core team. The plan was out, published in 2007. It, about a year and a half to create the plan, and it involved 1,000 live people, 23,000 online. And at the time it was published, media-wise, it had reached about 120,000 people. So that really, you know, set the, uh, the mark very high for all regional planning efforts. And I'm a regional planner, so we've been working on projects. We've been trying to uh, stand on the shoulders of greatness work, uh, been following this plan. 
<clears throat> and when we did the plan uh, 750, the plan for Southeast Florida, similarly, um, it was a plan, you know, headed by a regional planning organization, funded by a federal and state agencies, uh, led by uh, a consultant firm. We had about a year and a half also. And, and this is interesting. So in terms of our involvement, you know, and these numbers are, are kind of fuzzy, but in terms of our involvement of people, Less than 10 years later, we were able to get twice as many people live to the events, and nearly four times as many people online, and about 10 uh, times as many people, in one way or another, reached by the media, which was pretty interesting. So we started to think, what's the difference? You know, what's the innovation? How did we achieve that? They both had first-rate teams and people who really cared about the region, I think, you know, if you, if you look at the Louisiana Speaks document, um, when the planning effort was going on, Twitter was just invented, you know, uh, Facebook. Twitter was in, launched in 2006 and Louisiana Speaks was in 2007. Facebook was launched for the general public. It was out of the universities and became something that we all use to share our pictures of our kids with our grandparents and such. Um, by 2007, it was only a year that Facebook had been in development. And then websites. In 2006, Americans were only spending about two and a half hours per week, on average, on the web. Two and a half, two hours, really? Well, what did we do with all of our time when we weren't on the web? And, and then Louisiana Speaks come out. And the difference with 750 is so Twitter had reached more than 300 million people. Facebook had more than a, a billion users. And, and now we are spending about eight hours a week, I'm still surprised how low that number is, um, on the internet. And so Facebook, Twitter, and, uh, and websites. And I guess that's what I'm gonna talk about today, how we use these. Now as a planner, I didn't learn how to use these in planning school. And I can't say that social media is the part of projects that gets me all excited. For a little while there, as they just came out, they became this perfunctory thing that all planners did because you were supposed to do it, you know. Um, but but increase, we've seen the power of it in, in these last few years, especially. We've seen how it, gets, how it brings people to the table and how it affects the decision makers. So it's been a big part of planning projects. Let's talk about 750. Um, it wasn't just Twitter, Facebook, and the Americans on websites more that, that really made that project a success. I'm going to talk about the different aspects of it, how we brought people to the table, and then at the regional level, and then we're going to talk at the city level about how, how that, the plan was received, especially the more controversial elements like climate change and resilience. Our plan was for all of Southeast Florida, from Key West all the way up to St. Lucie County, incorporated, included Miami, it included uh, West Palm Beach and Fort Lauderdale, over um, 120 municipalities, and it was a, an economy larger than most states. And that was our plan, that was our charge. And we had a, a series of approaches, right? It started with identity, we went into digital communications, events, media relations, and interactive tools. The identity is probably an important first step. So the plan was called, before it was over, it was called 750. Very nice and simple. The original plan was called the Southeast Florida Regional and Municipal 50-Year Prosperity Plan Blueprint. Clearly created in committee. And then we worked with a branding consultant that said 750. And then email, Facebook, social media, summits and workshops. And then we had a variety of online tools that we engaged people with. In terms of digital communications, we did our best to made, make the website a completely interactive experience. There were polls that people could do, there was an online modeler that people could engage in, the tweets, the Facebook was all consolidated. The average visit per user was about four minutes, which is pretty incredible, really, if you think about people spending four minutes on a website nowadays. That same website um, became the plan. We started off by saying there won't be a hard copy physical document. The plan itself is going to be a website, so that way it can be a living document, you know. And then the plan won't be on some dusty shelf, because there won't be a bound plan, and there won't be a digital shelf. The 
in terms of the Facebook usage, we were lucky to hit uh, an age group between 35 and 45, roughly, a, a group that's hard to get out to different meetings that you don't usually see, the busiest, workingest, uh, raising kids demographic. They were able to interact with our plan by use of Facebook. Or with Twitter, here we're hitting a different age group. Twitter was hitting 20 to 28, a group that almost impossible to bring out to public meetings. And then we created a, an interactive app. Everyone could have it on their phone. You could participate in the plan. You come to a summit or you come to one of our workshops. You download the app and you could follow the plan and interact um, just by having it on the phone. And then probably one of the most helpful things that we did was the mass media campaign. So we compiled a list, all the municipalities we were working with worked with us to create a list, and then we sent um, over 250,000 messages you know, to, to everyone in the region, internet. Our open rate was about 22%, which sounds low, but if you think about the total number of people that were actually opening these messages and reading it, it was just actually a great way uh, to communicate with the public. And then, and then the events. And personally, I'm of the belief that um, your social media campaign is to bring people to the events. And really, the, the interaction, the communication between the public and the plan authors happens best when it's happening live and one-on-one. -on -one. Our events had to be like, you know, like this, like a summit. Multiple speakers with TEDx talk-like um, presentations, local experts and uh, international leaders, all varieties of people. We kept things interactive. We had keypad polling devices. We would ask them a question, and then they would immediately respond using the keypads, and we could see the result from the questions that we asked. Um, I know that CPEX uses this. Questions like, you know, did your parents walk to school? And we asked that question, I think this is in Delray Beach, and there was over 500 people. And, uh, and 86% said yes, their parents walked to school. Did you walk to school, right? I remember walking to school. Group in Bristol, Rhode Island, up until uh, uh, senior of college, I walked to school. And then you know where this is headed. Do your kids walk to school? So 90% of your kids weren't walking to school. And you don't have to give a, a lecture on urban design. People recognize the implications the health implications, especially, of uh, when we build our communities that way. Now, it was a regional plan, but as a, as a new urbanist, I am interested in the specific design at every scale. So we also did um, these sort of hands-on events where we did community image surveys, and people were given dots, red and green, and we showed them all variety of streets and buildings and public spaces. And as part of our regional plan, we had a conversation about streets, asking them, which do you like? People were more fond of the one on the right and less fond of the one on the left, for all the reasons that we planners know. And that was interesting, just for community members to see how others respond when pictures are put up, without any discussion, without any indoctrination or stats, just put up two pictures and ask people which do they prefer. And then we did this, one word cards, um, we'd give up cards, and the cards basically said, one word that comes to mind about Southeast Florida now and in the future. In this one case, we had 250 people give us answers, and the more times an answer appeared, the larger the word, you know? We did it real time, which is to say, we would give out these cards, we'd collect the cards, and we would tally it very quickly using a word cloud. And one word that came to mind about Southeast Florida now, people were saying disconnected, congested, fragmented, disjointed, and crowded. One word that came to mind, well, Southeast Florida in the future, connected, sustainable. The, the fact that connected was so large, you know, that's probably you know, nearly 100 people said something, said, said connected. And that gave a new mission, I think, to the project. The rest of the project was about creating connection, um, whether it's transportation systems or social systems. Connected was the new uh, word for the project. We also had multiple informal you know, get-togethers. There was a question as to whether we could use public money to buy wine, but it's Florida, so we did. 
And, um, and those, were, those were fun and exciting, talking to mayors in that way. We created a big map of the region. We put that on a wall. And um, through the course of a, of a week-long summit, like a, a conference like this, um, people were interacting with that map, and they were drawing their ideas for the region. Um, kiosks allowed people to give their information. They record these small messages to us, messages to the team. We turned that into a film. And then we traveled throughout the region. So again, you know, the social media was getting people to events. We got into my wife's little Mini Cooper and with these flags and all of our paraphernalia, and we drove up and down the region having a series of these uh, workshops, these road shows, doing some of the exercises that I showed and others in order to engage the community. And then after we'd gone from Key West all the way up to Indian County, we went back. And this time we were talking to the planning directors, the appointed and the elected officials. We said, this is what we learned talking to the public, and we gave them the information, and we got their feedback on the information, incorporated into the plan, and hopefully helped change some minds, you know, um, from one end of the state to the other. While the whole project was going on, we had work groups that were working in several, in six different disciplines on different aspects of the project. And, you know, it was like a big, event. Sometimes these work groups, we'd have 400 people in a room, multiple tables having different conversations all at the same time. Um, it was, uh, it's, it's chaotic and it's loud, but people got to talk to others across the table, people who weren't like them or who saw it a different way. And mayors might find themselves across the street, across the table from an Uber driver or, or something like that. So sort of various conversations happening all throughout. And at the same time, we were still talking to the agencies, to HUD and to EPA, to the to Florida Department of Transportation and to the, the conservationists and the developers and the property owners, um, talking about policies, talking about the future. In terms of media, for all of you planners out there, you know, I recommend using a, a media company, a public relations company. For this project, it was less than 5% of the budget and it was really the way that we were able to get into the major newspapers, you know. New York Times and the Wall Street Journal before this was over uh, interviewed us uh, for the project. National Public Radio. You really need a PR person's portfolio, their Rolodex, their contacts, in order to talk to someone um, like the Miami Herald as often as we talk to them. Or, um, or, or to the, the New York Times, for instance. So now with all of the projects we're doing at whatever scale, we're trying to make sure that we're involving a public relations person to get our, our word into the newspapers. Now, the interactive tools had a variety of online questions that we would ask. Um, for the first time in the region's history, we created a, a one-stop spot for GIS information. So planners and developers and federal administrators, and climate change people and environmentalists, everyone uses GIS information. but there was never one spot for it, and that was a big part of the project, and gave the project uh, sort of its authority and its utility. One of the GIS layers was just in which the coalition, coalition of building um, professionals or uh, businesses that we were working with, they were actually able to uh, label themselves as an asset toward a more resilient future, for instance, and, and kind of advertise their own businesses on one of the layers that we created. And then there was the online modeler. So we used MetroQuest for this, a big regional model, similar to what was done for Louisiana Speaks. Um, what was great about this one is it could be done on a phone. And, um, and you would go up to the website, and it would ask you to prioritize your values. You know, um, How important is an investment in culture and arts versus climate change readiness versus lower taxes or retaining working farmland? people would rank their values. And then they would be asked a, a couple questions about how they wanted to grow, how they wanted to invest, and to do what, what degree they wanted to, um, what level of importance they wanted to place on climate change. Once they'd done that, once they've gotten through the tool, one of the scenarios that we created would, would appear. Of the many scenarios we, 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 we made, the one that closely related to their uh, choices was the one that would come up. And at this point in this modeler, people had gotten a real education in, 
and transportation design and uh, land use and resilience planning. And then they had a chance to, to you know, sort of rate the different uh, scenarios and decide for themselves which scenario they ultimately wanted to vote on. Because it's America and it's exciting to vote. So everybody got a chance to vote on the different scenarios. Um, and as you remember from Louisiana Speaks, you know, we used the same criteria that, they, that you all used. Farmland consumed, infrastructure cost. One thing that was different is we were talking about the mix of building types. Transportation choices, the walkability of communities, the housing and transportation costs, and then new with this initiative was climate change resilience. There was a big portion where we talked about how one, how a community does uh, become more resilient, and people were able to engage in that conversation. I think that, you know, when to reach 73% of the population choosing what was effectively the smart growth scenario, it was because of all of the engagement that we had done and the conversation that we were able to have with the community. Pretty good. I mean, at one point, there were 1,400 people a week voting on the different scenarios. Um, the scenarios were trends staying the course, suburban expansion, strategic upgrades, sort of uh, small changes in terms of walkability, livability, resilience infrastructure, or the region in motion, a wholesale commitment to transit-oriented development, to um, stopping the suburban sprawl, or at least disincentivizing it, and to really investing in those places that we could, um, we could make more resilient, we could retrofit. So what was interesting was um, so many people were asking. They actually wanted a book. We loved the idea. It wasn't going to be a book. It was going to be a living document. It was going to be online. But we really underestimated Americans' desire to own a thing. You know, they just participated in this whole process, and they wanted the book. Um, so we made sure that the book worked in terms of its graphic design the same way that websites do, you know? The pages had a lot of white space by design. There was one-third text, one-third picture, and one-third funky, interesting little infographic in order to keep it uh, um, an interesting document. And then we made it for sale, right? Lulu. You can self-publish now any document. We've made it for sale, we put it online, and people have been downloading it. And I, but right before this session, I checked. So the, the document came out in 2015, and last month, 30 people had purchased the, the document. And we're selling about 400 to 500, imagine that, we're selling 400 to 500 of these documents a year. At the cost, the low, low price of 69.48, you see? So, you know, and like occasionally in Miami Beach, I'll find myself at a cocktail party, and I will see that at a bookshelf, we don't have a lot of bookshelves in people's homes in Miami, but sure enough, every once in a while on a bookshelf, there is uh, the 750 document. And I know what I'm going to talk about at that cocktail party. I'm going to bore them to death with the discussion of, of planning, you know. Um, yeah, so, so everywhere you go, in the used bookstores, the two used bookstores we have in the entire uh, city of Miami, there you occasionally you'll see the 750 document will pop up. So that's an innovation. But really, you know, as pretentious as I am about reading and books, and you know, I'm sort of old school, I guess, with my Gen X ways. Uh, in order to really get this message out, we created a film. We hired a film company, and we traveled around and we talked to the mayors. We talked to the heads of the Department of Transportation. Mayor Carruthers of Key West, and we talked to, to the various decision makers in our area, and, um, and we put them on film, and they made promises and pledges. And it was a really interesting film with a lot of interesting helicopter fly over B-roll and such. It was exciting. Um, and, and this is a film that's, that's being watched continually, which is, which is great. Helps get the word out. So that's how we did it. That's how you reach a million people. There's six million people in our region. One way or another, you know, a million people were involved in the plan creation process. As a planner, you're so used to doing a plan for a city, and then, you know, at the final adoption meeting, people say, I, I didn't hear about it. I didn't know about the plan. It still happened. It will always happen. But I was surprised by how many people were just, like, tired of us. They were tired of the spam mails, and they had gone to three of the different sessions, and they had voted already, and they were reading about us in the paper repeatedly. 
I, what was interesting about this process is that it really did feel like we did involve people uh, to the degree that, um, that was fitting, given the importance of the project. Now, just in a couple slides, on the topic of implementation, I want to kind of approach it a, a different way, you see. Um, I want to talk about the, the culture in our region, you know. Similar, you're a Gulf state, we're a Gulf state to the culture here. There was an article in Time Out magazine um, in uh, 2014, 40 things you'll never hear a Miamian say, all right? And a Time Out magazine is not a planning document, it's just a very clickable little online website. The, one of them, number six, was the winter's coming, brace yourself. Number 12, why aren't you wearing more clothes? It's true, you should see even the store, how people dress in my uh, neighborhood. It spices things up, um, and, and no one seems to have a problem with it. Number 21, I'm betting on the Dolphins to win the Super Bowl this year. We've given up on the Dolphins. And the number one thing, the number one thing that you, you've never hear a Miamian say was, do you want to make a plan for sea level rise? Right? Not a planning publication, just a, national, just a publication. The reality is, just like Louisiana, Florida has so much at stake, we don't even want to think about this. It's so depressing. I hate, as a planner, being now the climate change guy, the bringer of doom and gloom. I'm interested in, 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 in walkable, convivial, exciting, fun, um, pedestrian-friendly places, and not the slow rise and the sinking and the, and the disaster. We, are, we have to be responsible. We have to talk about these things. Um, but no one really wants to, you know. And to, to the degree that, you know, Florida is a battleground state. And we have one political party which is banging the other over the head with this climate change stuff. And it, it's a divisive topic. So when we did our summit, and we had 1,200 people come in seven days, there was a counter summit created in the same convention center. The anti-us, anti-750 people rented the better convention space than we had. You had to walk past the protesters with the big signs and giving out the pamphlets, and they had the nice, you know, like this, excellent lighting, the theater style, and we had the, the less expensive room over on the side. And this, this counter uh, conversation was happening as the same, at the same time as ours. And, and it's because this is a difficult topic. Yet, in terms of implementation, you know, in the last few years, my island, Miami Beach, has been lifting the streets. There's a plan for all of the streets to be brought up to four feet. The, our average height is not very high, and so that's pretty dramatic. Lifting the streets, putting pipes underneath them, draining underneath the streets. That top left image is the Starbucks next to my house. Our plan, the 750 plan, but also the local plans, um, all the many different conversations have been working together, and now when you restore one of the large historic buildings, you're preserving the facade, um, holding it up with steel, and you're jacking the building up. Even the largest of our structures is being lifted. Even the most fragile historic structures, there's a commitment to bringing them up. We've got two new streetcars which have come out in, in some ways of our 750 project and that discussion, our constant prodding on local municipalities and MPOs to, to, to contribute less, you know, to, we're so vulnerable, we want to put as little carbon in the air as possible so that way our consciences are clear as we ask the world um, to change its ways. And, and throughout, you know, it was, everyone said it was impossible, there was too much private land on the water for us to build continuous um, seawalls. Uh, but slowly, these islands, really the whole of, of uh, southeast Florida is a flood zone, and slowly we're putting in place uh, the seawalls that are necessary um, to keep the water out. Dr. Brichelle and our team said it best, um, the conversation itself changes the trend. It's hard on a regional plan to figure out exactly how your plan is changing the world. But the reason for all this online engagement the reason for involving as many people as possible is because it takes more than one or two people to change the world. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Jason, for giving us the, the regional uh, level of, of in innovative ways to include people in planning. Tom is going to talk a little bit about how to include that in district, the district level and also in the granular level in the corridors and neighborhoods. Please join me in welcoming Tommy. So good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> it's great to be back in Baton Rouge. It's been a few years since I've been here, and uh, I was working a lot with CPEX actually back 2009, 2011 time frame, so it's been uh, a real pleasure to come back and reconnect with a bunch of old friends that I hadn't seen in a while. Uh, and I also want to thank Jason. That was really uh, super insightful comments on thinking about this, uh, the innovations that have been happening in city planning at this regional or citywide level. And uh, I think it's really appropriate for us in Memphis, and, and this is sort of maybe a dangerous thing for me to say, but uh, uh, we haven't had a comprehensive plan in 40 years in Memphis, and we're just starting that process now. And we'd love to you know, talk to you more about that as well. Um, but, you know, that is a little bit risky thing to say because, you know, I, I hope it doesn't undermine my, the credibility of what I'm going to talk about now, right? Uh, but the thing that's been really interesting in Memphis, and uh, what, actually, I realize that that is, let me see if I can get the tech, hey, can you put that into full screen? Um, but the thing that, that, that I want to talk about today and the thing that's been interesting that's been happening in Memphis is that uh, it's become, uh, I guess, a center for these sort of uh, innovations in city building that are happening below the power structure, right? They're being led by small nonprofits, they're being led by neighborhood or community leaders, and they're being held mostly at the block, the neighborhood, maybe the district scale. Um, let's, see, uh, let's see if we can get this. Just the, full, the one right below that. If you go down and then you go to full screen, there you go. Up, up. No, full. One more, two more down. One more down. Uh, oh. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, right there's perfect. All right, there we go. And so what, what, the, uh, what this is, is these are six ideas of things that we have learned in Memphis. Uh, I had the pleasure and opportunity to work on a lot of these, but some of them I wasn't involved in. And they, they make up, as, as uh, Haley mentioned in her introduction, experiences that we had based on my work with the innovation delivery team uh, and our work around generating neighborhood economic vitality. Uh, and then, which is this idea about like, how do we wake up these tired kind of commercial nodes that are in our, our city. And then the last idea that I want to share with you is something I've been working on more recently related to the redevelopment of our Memphis Medical District. So. Uh, I want to get into these. Uh, first thing I want to do is just set the context a bit about Memphis. Uh, Memphis is not what you would consider a, a high growth, uh, top tier market. It's a slow growth market. And uh, one of the things that, that, the reasons for that is that we have uh, really seen a lot, we've been really ravaged by suburban sprawl. Uh, 1960, this was the city boundaries of Memphis. Each one of those dots represents about 25 people. But uh, even then, sort of before we had really started our, to get serious about sprawl, we were still relatively low density. But 1960, this is the population distribution. Uh, 1970, 1980, 1990, and in 2000, 2010. So the really troubling thing, right, is that uh, there's not a lot of new dots. Right? So between 1970 and 2010, the city grew by population-wise by 4%, but by geographic-wise, we grew by 55%. So super, super aggressive annexation strategies that results in now a city that is twice the size of Detroit with the same population base, right? So very low density, very low density city. And what do we do as we begin to, the trends are starting to turn, people are starting to come back into the city really since about 2000. And how do we wake up these kind of older neighborhoods uh, in a city that has lacked the plan until very recently, lacked the planning infrastructure to be, for the lead to be kind of taken at the city level. So here are six ideas for how you can do that. Uh, first of all, I guess I'd say this, uh, Memphis also a big center for creativity, lots of music and arts. And I always love this quote by Jane Jacobs, which is designing a dream city is easy, but rebuilding a living one takes imagination. And that I think is what you'll see, uh, it's one of a constant theme of these, these six ideas. So the first idea is just demonstrating the art of the possible. 
This is a, a, a street uh, in Memphis called Broad Avenue. Uh, this is a photograph that was taken in 2006 as part of a, a plan that was being developed for that area. Uh, there, at that point, this very bizarre one-sided main street with an industrial park really on the other side of the street was about 45% occupied. The businesses that were there had largely turned their back on the street, had bricked up the windows or boarded up the windows and were just kind of, do there was a couple of artists and a little pizza restaurant and that was about it. You could literally you know, take a nap in the middle of the street. And um, in 2006, the city did a plan for the area, and they did a code for the area, and they did all the, the kinds of things. But the thing was is that they never really had the infrastructure again in place to go and implement. And so by 2010, nothing had changed. Nothing had really happened. And the, the neighbors on the street, they began to kind of take matters into their own hands, right? They began to demand better of themselves, of each other, and of the city. And they went out uh, and, and, and had what Actually, I was in, in the street with uh, Jason Roberts from Better Blocks last week. The first Build a Better Block project outside of Texas was done here on the street. And they went out with exterior house latex paint, you know, painted the crosswalks, uh, painted the bike lanes, painted the parking, uh, invited the kids out from the neighborhood to design the crosswalks. And the city, uh, really having better things or other things they were focused on, just kind of let turned a blind eye and let them do their, their thing. Uh, they took the vacant storefronts and they set up sort of pop-up shops inside, very lo-fi kind of strategy, but they invited like 15,000 of their closest friends out to see what this street could be, to, to model it again off of what that original plan had done in 2006. And um, what the result was is that the, the, the bike lanes and the parking and all that stuff never really was removed. It just kind of stayed there. In fact, one of the things I love about this story is that if you park in the bike lane today, like on accident or something, the city will give you a ticket. So I love, I love this, this like informal becoming formalized, right? And uh, the thing that's been so great about Broad Avenue is that uh, they did this in 2010, and by two, but between the 2010 and really when things started to kick off there, and we started working there in 2012, the neighborhood had already started to change. But it was because they didn't just stop with the better block, right? They, they kept doing these small, uh, these small things on the street, these, whether it's pop-up retail incubators, these food truck rodeos, public art installations, night markets, all those types of things, uh, that then they began to see the payoff about two years later, right? And that's what it typically takes when you start to do this small stuff. Uh, is it takes about two years to start to, to see the flywheel effect happen on the real estate projects. But since then, we've seen about $25 million invested in this three block area, seven public art projects, I always love this one, the 50% increase in rent. People are like, oh, well, you know, isn't, doesn't that then lead to gentrification? Well, we went from like $4 a foot commercial rent where like nobody would even let anybody in their building because it wasn't worth their time or energy to like $8 a foot in commercial rents. So then at that point, it's like, wow, now I can actually put a tenant in my building. But uh, the thing that they did that was so great, it brought, and this is all then citizen-led, right? The city wasn't involved in this project. But the city been, began to sort of take note about what was happening and said this could be a model that could be used in other, other areas. So with the innovation team, we actually worked with the city to kind of create a team that was in the mayor's office, uh, had a, 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 a representative from each division of local government to work with neighborhoods that wanted to do these types of efforts. And, in, and I love this, this meeting, one of the, the chief of staff for the mayor said, you know, this is going to be a meeting of yes. Right? So how do we help neighborhoods do these types of efforts? Because we realized that as a city, we didn't have the capacity to do the big stuff that they needed. Um, here's a second idea for you, which is again, sort of somewhat related, but building neighborhood capacity. Um, and I love this, this image because it is a, uh, uh, a neighborhood and citizen-led effort to save a uh, municipal auditorium from demolition. So they're basically using this idea of pre-vitalization, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, on this effort. But how many of you guys have heard of IOBI, IOBY? Uh, a few of you. Uh, good. IOBI stands for In Our Backyards. It's the opposite positive, or positive opposite of uh, NIMBY, not in my backyard. And what I love about IOBI, and, and we took approach where we realized that, again, uh, we wanted to, to energize our neighborhood leaders to do bigger and bigger projects. 
Uh, so we asked IOB to come and partner with us in Memphis, we created a web portal where residents from the city were able to put ideas for things that they had in their neighborhood, that one thing that was always bugging them, that one blighted property, that one uh, street that was too wide, whatever it happened to be, and they began to put these ideas up on this website and then find co-conspirators or collaborators to work with on the project. And then after they went through this ideation phase, the projects became real projects. And they became things like finding an underpass and getting it actually funded through crowdfunding, these $25, $30 donations to help make this project possible. This one was funded over a party on one weekend. And the projects haven't just been in sort of the white uh, kind of hipster areas of town, right? They've really impacted the entire city. And it's been this sort of grassroots fundraising. It's almost like these, these little uh, community-led uh, genius grants, if you will. Uh, because what we've seen is that individually, each of those projects that was done is really cute, but collectively, the 176 of them that have been done and implemented in, across the city actually begin to have a transformative effect on the place, right? And they've raised $520,000 just on this platform since they got working in Memphis. I think that's a, a, a huge accomplishment of the citizen-led aspect to the planning that's been happening in Memphis. Um, idea number three is city-led uh, city street repair. So, we got really inspired, again, by Broad Avenue and started to say, why can't we take those same principles about redesigning the street temporarily and apply that to city projects? And so that's what the city has actually started to do. Well, they'll come in with paint and knockdown sticks and test designs a year or so before they actually then go implement them with the concrete bump outs and things afterwards. Uh, here's an example of where it didn't work where they took Riverside Drive, which is basically a highway between our downtown and our Riverside Park and they uh, closed one side of it and put in a bike and pedestrian lane. And it lasted for a year, and they realized that design didn't work. So they took it back out and are actually then gonna go back in with a different type of design. But it's this whole idea of testing before they invest. So again, small things that cities can do to begin to make impact. And I don't know if any of you guys in Baton Rouge or in other cities around uh, Louisiana are having backlash, um, sorry, bike lash. Yeah, having that? So it's a thing and it's happening. And uh, it's, we're in Memphis and we're just beginning to get over it, but, uh, but that, that project was also uh, partially a victim of bike lash. Uh, idea number four, fine-grained economic development. Our typical economic development strategies in Memphis have been to go out and recruit big businesses to come into the city, offering huge tax incentives, typically locating them in an industrial park somewhere outside of town. And one of the things we were working with the innovation team, again, was this whole idea of neighborhood scale economies. And uh, so we, we did a, uh, basically a retail incubator program where we went and negotiated uh, at market or below market rents for properties that had been vacant for a long time, signed a six month rent on the space because they wouldn't just sign that for somebody off the street, but if you're some organization that at least has a good or a bad reputation, some kind of reputation, they'll, and you have a check in your hand, they'll, they'll sign a lease for you. Um, and then we did a call for entrepreneurs uh, example, here are the first three that we did. Uh, the 50 entrepreneurs supply, uh, applied for the program. We work with the businesses on the street to select uh, some of the, those entrepreneurs to then open businesses for six months where they pay zero rent the first three months, and the last three months it ramps up so they're paying market rate rent, and then they get a ton of technical assistance through the course of the pro process. So they learn uh, everything from visual merchandising uh, strategies to how to do marketing, how to do QuickBooks, all those kinds of things to set that entrepreneur up for success. Um, here's an uh, example of one of the spaces that, uh, and shows what, I mean, we weren't really giving them, you know, class A space at all. Uh, but we would give them the space and say $1,500 and say, you know, do your best and, uh, on the, the build out and things. And this is sort of what, what you know, the spaces would turn out looking like. Uh, this is five in one social club. They build themselves as sort of kindergarten for adults. It's kind of like a maker space, like entry level maker space. But in the front part, it's also uh, a, a retail space. They now are just celebrated their three-year anniversary and also just bought a 7,000 square foot space right across the street where they're, they're going to keep their storefront and expanding their maker's operation over to the 7,000 square foot space. So, uh, you know, this, again, the effort on these, these businesses is like it's $20,000 uh, to basically run six months worth of uh, per storefront. 
and compare that to two recent economic development efforts we had had where we had spent about $125,000 in tax incentives per job created for some of the industrial scale projects. And this actually has the effect of adding property values to the rest of the street because it then goes from a dead storefront to something that's activated on a regular basis. Um, the fifth idea is uh, one of my favorites to talk about. Uh, it was one of the most fun projects we got to work on when I was with the innovation team. But it's this idea of pre-vitalization, so borrowing these lessons from the Better Blocks and the MIMFIX and the MIM, sh and the MIM Shop, the retail incubator of the world. Uh, we came across this building. And it's actually a photograph from my office at the time. Uh, so this is the historic Tennessee brewery. It was built between 1860 and 1890. And in January of 2014, the owners of the building said they were going to tear it down. They had owned it since 1997. And you can see where it's positioned. It's, right here, right next to the river, right around a bunch of office buildings and, and condos. Uh, and the, the idea for it had been that we can't figure out how to redevelop this. It doesn't make sense financially for us, so we're going to tear it down and build townhomes. Uh, so we kind of had the impression that there were, and these are the images, it was not just a, a, a neighborhood treasure. I mean, it's a city and really a national treasure of a building. Um, so our idea was to, to show a different calculus for the, for the property. So with the idea of revitalization being to impart new life and vigor into a neighborhood or a building, pre-vitalization for us was this tactical and temporary activation of the empty places to demonstrate what's possible. So we didn't have to think really very long and hard about it, and we knew that you know, string lights and beer fix a lot of urban challenges. So we said, well, let's turn this into a beer garden. And so we, it was actually a community-based effort. We took volunteers. We, we talked to the owners of the building to giving us. Uh, it was really turned out to be about a three-month lease on the space. And our plan was to say, stop thinking about this as this comprehensive, gold-plated redevelopment. Instead, think about it as a single-story building with a really tall attic. And then incrementally think about the redevelopment of the space. And you know, we literally, people signed up. We had to turn people away every weekend on the, on the cleanup and prep work to empty out the space and empty out. This was the roof that had fallen in off the courtyard here. Um, we did a series of community builds. This is you know, Perry, he's a local carpenter and donated a lot of his time and effort. And we just built the space out of what was laying around. Um, we did have a friend with a CNC router that was really helpful in helping us assemble chairs. He just cut out the legs of these chairs. And uh, you know, a group of not craftsmen, just people that lived in the neighborhood, put 30 chairs together in one afternoon. But you know, this is, it was all a very sort of DIY kind of an effort. And I think that was part of the charm about it, right? And the result was uh, this kind of beer garden. And then a lot of people showed up. And so over the six week period, we had all kinds of people show up. The crowds changed throughout the day. And uh, we measured everything. Again, the data became a really, really important part. We had about 900 responses to surveys. We did both lo-fi techniques, where you just add people, sort of write their inspirations for the space on the wall, to full surveys, to scraping Twitter and Instagram data to figure out who was doing what and who was visiting and where they were coming from. Um, and you know, what, the, what it taught us was that we had 25,000 people come through the space in a six-week period. We took an investment of $20,000 just to do electrical and bathrooms and some of that stuff. The result was about a $325,000 in sales over the, the six-week operation, and we started a new conversation about historic preservation in the city. Instead of this sort of let's link our arms and sing kind of kumbaya around the building, it's actually let's make a new financial case for these spaces. And that then later is coming back into play with that old uh, municipal auditorium, which is in the process of being transformed into a brewery. Uh, so it's again, this beer thing has a common uh, play in Memphis. But then after this effort, this guy stepped up and bought the building and is now in the process of doing the renovations. So it was effort, overall, the effort was, uh, was a successful effort. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is more, more recent work, but I think it's another idea for cities. And it's really just to play to your strengths. Play to your anchors, these, these anchor institutions that are these economic engines in your city. They've been there for 50 years. They're going to be there or more. And they're going to be there for another you know, 150 plus years. Um, these are your churches, your, I mean, not your churches, I'm sorry, your, 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 your universities, your colleges, your hospitals, your eds and your meds, those types of things. Churches could be one too, I guess. 
Um, and in Memphis, this is an area called the Memphis Medical District. It sits right between downtown Memphis and an area called Midtown Memphis. And downtown Memphis has been on this upper trajectory for you know, 15 years or so. And Midtown Memphis recently has been waking up with a couple of really big projects. And the neighborhoods there, again, starting to kind of click on all cylinders. And so we have this cluster of eight major anchor institutions, med schools, hospitals, community colleges, and the like. And they start, suddenly started to look at each other and say, you know, we don't have any place to point the finger anymore. This area right around us is actually the most distressed area in, in the core of the city right now, and it's time for us to step up and do something about it. And so uh, the idea was is that you know, this area had, had 24,000 employees and students. They had a uh, uh, $3 billion operating budget, $3.5 billion in planned capital investment, and yet all the area around them kind of sucked. Right? It really lacked this cohesive sense of place. So our idea uh, for the anchor strategy was how do we leverage the assets of the institution to uh, strengthen the communities that are between and around their campuses. So we did a little bit of analysis and studying. We realized that, look, they own about 50% of the land. They're also spending a ton on parking. There was 270 acres of commercial and institutional parking lots in this two and a half square mile area. And they're spending about $337 million either in current or planned uh, parking infrastructure. That's not money that's being spent on healing, teaching, or research. Um, and then we also looked at the results on the housing. In 1970, this area had about 24,000 residents, and today it's got about 9,000. So it's been an outmigration of people from this, largely because the institutions have been buying up uh, blighted apartment buildings you know, that were blighted in the 70s and 80s and tearing them down and putting parking lots in as a defensive measure. And institutions are really good at acquiring land. They're not quite as good at disposing of the property. But they realized sort of that they had to do something. And so uh, they, 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 that's what brought them to the table to do this work. Um, the built environment then responds to those patterns, right? Those built environment patterns. So you end up with very auto-oriented uses, and you create a monoculture in the district. It became all biotech uses as everything kind of got pushed out to the edge. Um, Another thing that uh, we also looked at is we looked at where the potential was, right? Where the employees and the students have been living. So only about 3% of the employees and only about 6% of the students were living in the district, but they're living very, very close by. And the apartment buildings and the things that were in the district, we, we started to survey them and see kind of who was living there. It's largely employees, it's largely students. By the way, they're paying downtown rents for apartments that are eight foot or nine foot ceilings with linoleum floors and, you know, not, I mean, they're, they're fine, but they're not great. And they lack the amenities that all the downtown spaces have got. Yet people were paying this premium because it was close to where they were living or where they were working and where they were studying. Uh, another thing that we saw that was a lot of potential is the number of turnover, just the employees, 2,500 start jobs each year, uh, 1,300 new students start taking classes each year. Those are opportunities to get people to move into the district. Um, and then that parking, remember I mentioned that, 270 acres of commercial or institutional parking in the district, 110 of it is owned by the institutions. Those become our, they're our partners and they are on our board as an organization uh, and guiding our work. Uh, so how do we work with them to then reposition some of those parking lots for actual developments? Uh, so the strategy and the implementation really takes this approach. We have the Memphis Medical District Collaborative, which is our organization that connects the dots across the institutions and then, then sort of implements the strategy. Um, the anchor programs, which is how we leverage the, the employees, the students, the real estate, the money that's being spent. Uh, that's, that's how, that's like, think about that as like a demand side intervention. Doing some kind of a tactic to increase the demand in the neighborhood based on the employees, the real estate, and the economic spend of the institutions. And then the district planning work. And I'll just touch on these three quickly. Uh, the collaborative, there's a whole series of things. Uh, so we think about public space, we think about safety security, we think about programming and marketing, we think about community development work. And I'll just touch on these really quickly. From the public spaces point of view, uh, we uh, don't have the budget today to blow out the curbs and the sidewalk, but we learned a lot from the innovation teamwork. We realized that you can make these more subtle interventions in a place. I used to live in Austin, Texas, and this was across the street from my apartment. It was about $20,000 to construct. They took three parking spaces out in front of the neighborhood grocery store, and they built a seating area and a landscaping area. And it totally changed the feel of that street, and it was a $20,000 investment. We didn't spend a million dollars blowing out the sidewalks. Uh, and so 
we work to identify where, sorry, we work to identify where about 30, 35 of those types of points are in the district and are slowly kind of implementing these things uh, across. We're doing, you know, eight or so of these uh, 50 to $100,000 solutions. So it's not tactical urbanism, right? It's not just what does $500 in a bucket of paint you know, get you. It's the, and it's not at the other end of the, of the spectrum of what's the million dollar solution. It's like the, what's the $150,000 solution. So we've identified, you know, 35 of these things and we're doing four or five of these a year. Um, and these are just one example when I say public space, that's one example of a type of public space project we're working on. Safety, security, it's like in Memphis, there's two things people complain about, and it's grocery stores and public safety. So the numbers in this area show there's almost no crime, but there's a high perception of crime. So what we are thinking about is coordinating the, the four police departments and the eight security teams that are in the district, along with the strategy around environmental, so lighting, uh, cameras, and a communication strategy to help uh, communicate the, what's happening in the public safety front. Uh, programming and marketing, so just doing events, getting people out of those buildings, out into the streets. It's a project we do, it's like a slow roll, like a slow bike ride type project every other week called Freewheel. Um, and one of the things you got to think about when you do this work is how do you, everything you do needs to like expand a little bit more on solving a bit more of the problem, right? So these, we are trying to undercut any excuse that somebody has not to get on a bicycle. So if you don't have a bike, we have a fleet of bikes that we rescued out of this building and that this uh, Carpenter Street Bike Shop, which is a program that teaches kids how to work and repair on bikes and then places them in, in jobs and bike shops around the city, uh, they actually repaired the bike. So we have this whole fleet of 40 vintage bicycles that you can pull out and, and ride. So if you don't want to bring your bike to work that day, just borrow one of ours. And every other week, it's like 75 or 80 people meet up next door to a brewery. Again, these are common themes in Memphis. And, uh, and you get like a history of a neighborhood or uh, future developments are coming, here's what's happening in the neighborhood type of a, of a lecture for five or 10 minutes. And then you get on the bike and you're able to see just how closely your work is to all these great neighborhoods and places to live that are in the medical district. Um, Community development, we're doing some micro retail installations on some vacant storefronts. So these are 200 uh, to 300 square foot retail bays. Uh, I was on a trip with the Knight Foundation a couple years ago and we were in Portland and we were studying commercial corridors in Portland, Oregon. And you know, one of the cool things about Portland is that the commercial corridors are absolutely fantastic places. And they, but something you'll notice is that they make up the entire ecosystem of the entrepreneur. So they've got from the guy that's like trying to sell you something out of his jacket to like the person that's in the, uh, the, the stall, like the little um, basically stand selling things to somebody that's in a retail truck, to somebody that's sharing a shop front with two other people, to somebody who has their own shop front. So there's, regardless of where you are on the spectrum as an entrepreneur, you have a place that you can enter. And so we're building that, that whole spectrum back into our neighborhood as, as well. And this is an example of one of those types of spaces. Um, so another area is this idea of these demand interventions with the institutions that I was uh, talking about, and that's live by hire. So uh, the institutions have put in uh, about uh, $250,000 that was leveraged with local philanthropy money to create an incentive program that offers $15,000 incentives to buy a house in the district or uh, $2,000 to sign a lease in the district. So this whole idea is to say, how do we get more students and more employees moving back into the district? Well, one idea is to jumpstart that by offering forgivable loans. It's a program that just started this week. So it's a pilot program. We'll see how it goes. But the energy is there. Then it will go on for four or five years. Uh, buy local. I mentioned the $3 billion operating budget. Well, $1.2 billion of that is purchasing. And $350 million of that is stuff that could be spent in the city of Memphis. Only 50 million of it's being spent in the city of Memphis today. So getting with the institutions about how they can begin to be more intentional about how they're spending uh, is impacting the local economy is a really big part of it. And then hire local is the same kind of concept, but looking at where they're, they're going to they're gonna be hiring 7,000 people over the next five years. So where are those uh, 7,000 people coming from? Because anchor institutions, and this is one of the reasons that you ought to be thinking about an anchor strategy in your city, 
May, they make up the entire, their employee base makes up the entire socioeconomic spectrum of the city. They got $10 an hour jobs all the way up to major research jobs. So if you're building a neighborhood for the employees of anchor institutions, by default, you're building places that are inclusive and equitable. Um, and then the development, just really beginning to think about, and the, this is our district, beginning to think about you know, where the redevelopment opportunities are, what they look like, and then partnering with the anchor institutions to say, hey, all that 11 acres of surface parking lot that you've got, what if we help you craft an RFP to attract a developer? Uh, what if we uh, actually partner with you on putting in affordable housing and that kind of thing? And so with that, I'll, I'll stop and uh, leave you guys with this. And thanks for, thanks for the time. These are all sort of small projects, and we hope that one of these ideas maybe catches on in, in uh, the work you guys are doing. Thanks. Thank you both. As um, Central and South Louisiana start to recover from our flooding that we've had this last year, I, I'm just over there thinking of ideas and ideas that we can use from, from both of your projects. So thank you very much. Um, on that note, I'll ask a first question and then I'll turn it over to you guys for some questions. Can you guys tell us some of thinking of the flooding that we're going to be planning and recovering from for the next few years? Um, can you tell us some of the tools that we can use from there and how we might use it here in Baton Rouge? I can start here. <clears throat> we were talking about this earlier. We were talking about the, the general belief is that, you know, the flooding that you had recently was a fluke event that will not happen again because it was so bad it's hard to imagine that that's just now the way things are, right? Um, I think what CPEX has done a great job with so far, I mean, I guess I was the online guy, so um, you've done a great job getting out maps, talking about flood zones and, and making very clear people can look at their house and they can see the situation that they're in. I think that's pretty important. I think um, an online, online tools that allow people to look at their house and look at how things are changing and find out their flood zone um, in the quiet of their home when they're not being preached at, um, uh, in the middle of the night perhaps when they're getting nervous. I think making as much information available online as possible is, has a, a large effect. You know, that's um, one way of getting the word out. Uh, and, and making that information available, of course, to media sources. You've, CPEX has done an excellent job. Uh, local municipalities have done an excellent job. Um, giving uh, online tools or images or maps to the media in a format that they can use. If you watch the, new, the local news, you, you're now seeing maps, flood zone maps, for instance, that one could, could understand when they're watching. Uh, the six o'clock news, right? So, so creating imagery that people can look into, making it both available online and um, getting it out to the media as much as possible. So they're hearing these messages from a variety of sources. Seems like a very important approach to me. Um. Yeah, I would second that. The, the other thing I would add, and I, and I know you guys are already doing this because I was in a presentation earlier today and I, I saw a lot of um, actual built examples of sort of models for, model approaches for how you deal with this sort of oncoming um, uh, occurrences that you're seeing of the 500 year storm, right? It's now happening, seems like, once or twice a year. And um, so what do you, you know, actually going out and prototyping some of these ideas, uh, some of the, the, the concepts that the uh, designers and the academics are doing and putting a little bit of a small investment behind them and, and testing some of the, the building typologies that might work. And like I said, I, I think you guys are doing some, some of that and I've seen some of the work that's been presented actually just here today. Um, but, you know, doing that in a way that it's organized and then being communicated to people that says, you know, look, there are solutions to what we're dealing with here, and uh, here's some ideas, and figure out which ones are right for you, and uh, then begin to, to implement them with the help of, uh, whether it's uh, federal, state, uh, philanthropy dollars, whatever it happens to be, to, to leverage it to prototype those examples. Thank you. I love the idea of the online conversation, starting a conversation online, and then let, letting people talk back and forth that Jason brought up that could be very useful to us here, but also some of those demonstration projects, looking for those $150,000 projects instead of those multi-million dollar projects where we can help. 
I'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. Don't be shy. Yes, please. <laughs> Did y'all hear that? They call it Lafayette Cheapscape. <laughs> First project coming soon. So you'll have to try, uh, go see it in Lafayette. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and it's it's not it's intended to be quick, right? It's intended to be you do this project, you learn from it, and then you actually then invest right behind it with uh, that, you know, more expensive permanent infrastructure. I didn't talk about one of the projects, but we've done a series of these better block projects across Memphis, and we call them the Memfix is sort of the name for it, and fixing the intersection kind of thing. And one of them's in a neighborhood called the Edge neighborhood, and it's right in between downtown and, and midtown, right? And it's actually in the medical district. And there's a, one of these X-looking intersections that aren't quite squared, and they're super, super wide. And about a year and a half ago, a neighborhood group got together and, and did one of these better block types of uh, intersection repairs. And they went out and they created all these big plazas uh, out of the intersection and lined it with planners and then they activated the space and did a bunch of really cool stuff. Well, so we're now going back in and worked with the city and they repaved that area because it was in the potholes everywhere and all that kind of stuff. And we're, we're actually spending a, a, we're not going super cheap, but again, we're doing this 200, I think it's a $200,000 budget for that one intersection. And going back in with epoxy gravel and stone bollards and planters, real, like, Real planners, not just out of a uh, pallet, but actual real planners. And um, creating these formal plazas that are in the space. And the layout looks totally different than the layout looked when the engineers just painted it out at first. And it's because we learned from it. And so now it's got reverse angled parking and uh, a couple of other things that we've been experimenting in some other cities. So this idea of just experimenting with your public infrastructure, I think kind of freaks out a lot of cities, but I think it's a really important step in the evolution of, of being smarter about how we, we spend our very, very scarce resources that we have in a city like Memphis. Yes. Project, the 750 project was funded by a federal grant, right? And that's becoming less and less uh, available. The, <clears throat> the work that I'm doing recently is in Mobile, Alabama, and we're actually working with uh, uh, homeowners associations and, uh, and community associations and community development corporations. So, um, so we work with the city that needs to create the plan that's required by the statute and those cities tend to find um, funding pretty regularly, right? But the, the, the most innovative stuff, I think, is, is happening now coming from the neighborhood associations and the community development corporations. So in Mobile, Alabama, I think it's safe to say the community felt like the official planning department was not bringing them um, the solutions that they needed. And so they just started to get together as, uh, as community members and, and to go to the philanthropic organizations and to find monies to bring in planners. And now, naturally, you know, for us, uh, you know, the pricing, you know, we, we charge a, a municipality uh, something, one thing, and we, we would charge a community association another. Um, but we know that when we're working with the community association, we're going to do the tactical urbanism. We know there's going to be some very cool online stuff. We're going to be able to create a film. And we know that working on the smaller scale, we're able to invent in ways that we, we haven't before. So that's, that's sort of another innovation or something new about my work. I find myself working more and more for these private entities, um, and, uh, and that's pretty exciting. So yeah, I mean, if you're looking to find a way to fund the plan for your town or your neighborhood, look to these organizations, you know, um, because, uh, because then they can become a leader 
in a way that they've been, they've been seeking to through the traditional route of being the planner. Um, so I have three quick case studies that uh, are just like funding stories, right? I'm not the case studies. Uh, the innovation team, which I was mentioned a couple times in our work, and some of that early stuff, some of the earlier ideas came out of that work. That was funded really in two, threefold. One was from a grant from National Philanthropy and the and Bloomberg Philanthropies, uh, that was then leveraged from investment from local government, uh, and then further leveraged with local philanthropy dollars. So that was purely that was how that was funded. There was some piece of it that was like fee for service actually is then how that organization is sort of ongoing its maintenance. So as I left to go to the, the, the medical district work, uh, that's what we were setting up now. And now they're almost serving a little bit like a consultancy for philanthropy and for local government. Um, the MMDC, our organization that I work for right now, uh, we're funded by the institutions. So the institutions pay in based on the scale of the institutions, and so not everybody pays the same thing. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, for instance, pays more than the, than the, uh, the, the small community college does. Um, but then that then is further leveraged by local and national philanthropy. So that, that's sort of the funding mix there. The city doesn't put any money into the Memphis Medical District Collaborative. Uh, the third thing I might mention is how the city is building the capacity around this comp plan when it has literally no planning department. There are eight city and regional plan planners for the, the city and the county. Eight, like for, um, that's a community of just shy of a million people. So how do you begin to build this, this planning capacity? And that, again, is looking to local philanthropy and uh, to uh, a, a, a prior, changing the priorities of local government and also to the business community. Uh, the, the Chamber of Commerce in Memphis has stepped up in a really big way and they are, they're uh, underwriting a lot of the planning work that's happening. So those are the three. The, you have to be creative, right? It's not because none of those mixes include federal dollars, and very few of them then begin to include the local dollars because nobody's got any money anymore. And one last point along those lines. You remind me more and more. I'm actually working for the a university in Albany, New York. I'm working for the university in San Marcos, Texas. I'm, work, I'm working for the university. And what we said to that university is, your university can't be all it can be until the neighborhoods around it are all that they can be. And so the universities in that case are paying for neighborhood planning. It's in their interest, and, uh, and that's been working also. Yeah, it, so the, 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 you're actually absolutely correct. And it becomes a, a talent retention issue. It becomes a, our employees don't have a place to live issue. It becomes a, we're spending $337 million on parking issue. Um, and at the end of the day, that, that, that spend that they invest in, in our organization has got to be as integral as like their IT budget. Like that's, that's sort of how you, you uh, bring them on board because this is stuff that they can't be doing. Yeah, really. Good. So during 750, absolutely. We went to the churches in Little Haiti. We went to the coffee shops in Little Havana. Um, we went to the golf courses of Miami Beach. And, uh, and we just, we had our events where people are. When we did the road show like I was talking about, um, you know, it was, it was standing outside of restaurants and, uh, and outside of uh, grocery stores often in order to, and we're working in Mobile and we're going really to the churches. Our charrette space is in the is in the basement of a church because that's where the community goes, and you know it's it's fun to talk about these big projects with these big budgets, but we worked in Jean Lafitte, uh, Louisiana, a little town south of of uh, New Orleans with CPEX, and there we we tried the Facebook and the Twitter and the online messaging, and we had almost no responses. Right, it, it was duck season. There's no way anyone was going to be online. <laughs> And, uh, and we 
did the hands up, we, we advertised it through all of our traditional mechanisms, and then we, we said, come, this is going to be a hands-on session, we're going to give you the map, we're going to make, we're going to deputize you as a planner, and no one came. So then what did we do? We said, all right, we're going to try this again. Two days later, we got the mayor, we got the city council, we talked to everybody, CPEX did a phenomenal job with this, and there is all word of mouth. And they drove around and they knocked on people's doors. Mm -hmm. And then we had one of our biggest participation events, you know, because there it was about personal relationships. Um, it was about it was about knocking on doors. And uh, and then we had something like 150 people in a town of 1,500, and they all came. So the the online stuff uh, is not relieving us of our duty to to get out there and to talk to people and to um, and to go where they are. It helps if you bring jambalaya too, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, in the medical district work, uh, that two and a half square mile area, I mentioned that there's not a whole lot of people there, but it still, again, doesn't let you off the hook because 43% of the population that is there is in poverty. Only 7% of the uh, population are actually homeowners in the area. So it is a, it's a very, very classically distressed and disinvested neighborhood. Uh, our organization, sort of our, our, our thoughts is that it's not just, there's no silver bullet in the community engagement side. You've got to do multiple different things. So one is that our office is on a storefront on, um, in, a, in one of the main streets. So people can just stop in any time, right? There's a sort of an open door policy, which sometimes we rethink that. <laughs> but um, it, so far, so far, we're, we're still going with it. Um, the uh, second thing is, is that our board of directors is made up of the institutions, of course, but also uh, the heads of the community and neighborhood associations that are in the areas surrounding it. So you have the, 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 the head of the, the neighborhood association for Victorian Village or for the Edge neighborhood. They have the same vote that the CEO for Methodist Hospital Systems has. Um, another thing that, um, which is helpful, and so uh, we also then go regularly to the neighborhood association meetings and are just kind of part of the community with them. But there are areas that are in the district that don't have those formal networks established. And they're also, what we're learning is they don't have the informal networks either. And so we're doing a lot, we are doing some work with the churches, but what it ends up being is like we're just doing neighborhood block parties. So we'll go into the neighborhoods, and this is one of the most classically distressed area, and it is uh, largely actually a homeless population that, that's in the area, so they're passing through a lot. And we work with one of the churches, and we'll throw a neighborhood block party and just talk to people. And it becomes very lo-fi. You don't have clipboards. You don't have anything like that. You're just, you know, doing some of that work that's uh, just listening to people, putting names with faces, uh, that kind of thing. So you've got to do it at multiple different levels. Because at the same time, we have Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and websites, and all of that. So it just depends, and it's got to be a very nuanced approach to it. Back row. Yeah, that's really good. Um, so on our Lulu site, where you can buy the 750 book, we actually did embed this little questionnaire. Thank you for purchasing the book. And then five questions come up. And we were, uh, we were curious about who was buying it. So um, there are two regional planning associations, South Florida Regional Planning uh, Association, Treasure Coast Regional Planning Association. And they're committed to the, to the schools, to the colleges and the universities. So they if there's a planning class being held anywhere in Southeast 
Florida, uh, they're going to the university, going to the school, going to the professor, and talking about the project. And we find that a lot of these pr professors are making the 750 book one of the course readings. So that's generating a lot of uh, interest. Also, chambers of commerce. Um, the chambers of commerce in our community are, are just like most, um, forward-thinking, pro-development, pro-moving forward, and they like the before and afters, they like the, uh, the big vision that planning tends to produce. So the chambers of commerce um, have helped get the word out, and so all of a sudden, like, I'll find that, honestly, a dry cleaner has bought the 750 book. Why would a dry cleaning service buy our plan? And it's because through some chamber of commerce event, or from some uh, Main Street Association, uh, they heard that, uh, that their little dry cleaning uh, shop is part of a larger effort to improve Southeast Florida, and they want to find out more about it. So, so there's different organizations committed to going to different groups. And the last thing I'll say is, it's a beautiful document. It's got to be. It's got to be something that people actually want to flip through. And as planners, we've got to learn how to make beautiful documents. We usually, we used to come from the tradition of land development regulations and zoning, right? And it, it didn't matter whether it was beautiful or not, this is the law, and lawyers will learn the law, and we will play planners, and the planners will learn the plan. Uh, now we're now in this new world of these, these documents have to be beautiful, interesting, funny, um, even ironic at times, which is weird for us. And so part of every team now is the graphic designer to make the document beautiful. And the beauty of the document, the compelling visual quality of the document is what gives it legs. Have any more questions? Just really quick, I'm always afraid, just as you're saying, Alan, you know, the film festival that we have or the block party that we have that uh, doesn't change anything, right? Or the tactical urbanism intervention that we do four times because it never became uh, the law and it never got installed permanently. And um, while innovation might come outside of the planning department, we still need to be planners because there is the you know, statutes require plans. These plans have the force of law. Um, we still need to make sure that we're changing the land development regulations the way you've been showing. We've been changed, we're reforming the zoning code. We need to throw a party and have a great time because the conversation itself is super important. But we also have to remain uh, committed to those legal documents which, uh, which last past the party, past this administration, you know, 10 years and 20 years continue to have an effect. It's a, it's a really good point. Innovation might not be born in the planning department, but you got to bring the planning department along with you. So I, I, I agree with that. Um, I also think that, um, and maybe I don't think I actually spent enough time talking about the innovation teams and how they were set up, but you know, one of the things that, that um, former Mayor Bloomberg really had the opinion of is that 
Uh, if you really want to make an impact in the way that most people are living, impact at local government level. And even within that, strong mayor forms of government are actually the best entry point for uh, making that change at the local government level. So the innovation teams, and Memphis was part of a five city pilot group of, of cities, um, was intended to have a, a team of experts, or generalists really, I guess not even experts, but generalists that were focused on civic innovation, but with a special relationship with the mayor's office. And so while we were within that mayor's office, we were working, every, our whole job was to prototype these city challenges and then scale up within traditional government how those proje processes or uh, projects would, those ones that worked, w would become part of the culture. So the head of the original innovation team uh, is now the COO of the city of Memphis. And so it really became this infectious nature of learning about innovation and then bringing that into uh, local government so that it can sort of transform what's happening at the government level. So that's why the city is building its planning department now. That's why all those things are beginning to happen is because uh, Doug McGowan, the COO, saw all this stuff happening at the neighborhood level and said, the city has a role. And the city's role is to see, uh, uh, in, in some cases, it's to maybe uh, take that responsibility on. In other cases, it's like I was mentioning with the MemFix model, uh, it's to let the neighborhoods do their thing and us to be the support mechanism. So we have now, like I was saying, that uh, uh, each division of local government assigns one representative to help do these neighborhood-based efforts. But the city is helping the neighborhoods do that work now as opposed to just standing back and letting them do it. So there is a sense of ownership attached with it. And then as part of the planning effort in Memphis, that will then quickly be followed, I would hope, and that's kind of the strategy is, at least to, uh, with uh, some type of a new code to then implement the plan. Yeah, I mean, it could be. Well, well. so we've, we've gone through that once. The innovation team started under one mayor, and the second mayor then has come in and has kept it because he saw the value of it. Mm -hmm. um, and because we, one of the things that, if you also uh, follow Bloomberg, you'll know that, you know, he's big on data, and you can't manage what you can't measure. And so the innovation team, uh, one of the things they, they cycled through was a performance management arm that we incubated and then moved into city government. So it reports out on how city government is doing. So the second mayor, uh, the, the first mayor rather, lost a re-election race to a new mayor who came in and actually amped up everything that was happening on the innovation front. But you're absolutely right. I mean, you could have a mayor come in and say, I'm, I'm gonna go back to the old way of doing things. But if you can make your measures so transparent and in, in your, you're out in front with all of your successes and your failures, it kind of, you can kind of almost talk past the politics of it out to the people, I think, a little bit. Um, and uh, I, I think that's what this innovation, the civic innovation is trying to do. Um, and we'll see how it goes. I do, I do definitely see this changing. It's, it, things are getting more ingrained in the planning departments. Um, I'm, as a director of implementation here for CPEX, I'm a landscape architect and a planner. And so I don't go into any project thinking, without thinking, how am I gonna build this? Who are, how are we going to fund it? Who are the partners and getting them all to the table? I'll say one of my favorite meetings I've been in the last couple of months was uh, with some planners who are sitting up here on the front. Um, and it's planners sitting at the table, their engineers sitting at the table, and they brought us in, not the other way around. And they said, here's what we're doing in our city right now. We're doing this temporary project for three weeks or so. And as soon as it's done, if it's a success, we can tweak it a little bit, but we're falling right behind it and we're gonna build it. So they're really just testing it out, not to just show you something different, but they're testing it out to see what works and then they're following it with implementation. And I, that makes me so excited. <laughs> so thank you guys. So we'll end on that. Thank you to our speakers. I really appreciate your inspiration, and I hope you guys can take some of this back.